Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a proud part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being so much more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 157, and we are going to talk about the rough wooing. This is when Henry VIII thought he could bully love. He could bully love into being formed. Um, We'll talk about that in a minute, but one quick admin note. Are you looking for a wonderful gift for the tutor lover in your life? If so, what about a tutor con ticket for next year? TutorCon 2021 is happening. Three days of tutor themed talks, music, bonding with your new tutor best friends, and fun in beautiful Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Lancaster County in October is perhaps one of the most beautiful places. Um, And it's happening October 1st through 3rd, I think I said. You can find out all the details at englandcast.com slash TutorCon 2021. So listen, I have fewer than 30 tickets left. I think I have 27 as I'm recording this. So they're probably going to sell out. And so this is like a perfect gift for the tutor lover in your life. And if you want to have something to put under the tree, because you don't get like a physical ticket, as long as you get your tutor con ticket by around, let's say, December 18th or so, then I will send a card to the recipient. So you have something that you can put under the tree to say, hey, you're coming to TutorCon. Hooray, we can't wait to see you. So again, englandcast.com slash TutorCon 2021. And when you do get your ticket, if you want me to send a card, please send me an email too so that um, I'm able to do that. Okay, awesome. It's going to be so much fun. It's just going to be so much fun. I can't wait. We all need something to look forward to right now, don't we? And it's awesome. All right, so now let's talk about the rough wooing, which I have to say, you need to be very careful when you start researching rough wooing because Google will give you some very dodgy and questionable results with that query string. (laughs) So when King James I became King of England, it was the first time that England and Scotland were ruled by the same leader, and he was actually Scottish which was really Scotland getting the final laugh after England had spent nearly a decade in what has been called an orgy of destruction, trying to break up the alliances between Scotland and France, which England saw as an existential threat. In Scotland, the war was called the Eight or Nine Years' War, depending on when you start counting. But the term rough wooing actually comes from the fact that both England and France were fighting to decide where the baby Mary Queen of Scots was going to marry. Sir Walter Scott apparently coined the phrase rough wooing, and it begins to appear in history books from about the 1850s onwards. Supposedly, the phrase seems to derive from a famous remark by George Gordon, the fourth Earl of Huntley. And he says, We liked not the manner of the wooing, and we could not stoop to being bullied into love. The historian William Ferguson contrasted this kind of jokey nickname with the devastation that it caused. He says, The English policy was simply to pulverize Scotland, to beat her either into acquiescence or out of existence. And Hartford's campaigns, that's the Earl of Hartford, Protector Somerset, resemble nothing so much as Nazi total warfare, blitzkrieg, reign of terror, extermination of all resistors, the encouragement of collaborators, and so on. So it sounds really nasty. Like many of us who are fans of the Tudors, I had been familiar with the term rough wooing, and I was vaguely aware that it was a war over Mary, Queen of Scots. But it's only been through more recent readings of the period through the reign of Edward VI that I began to see just how destructive it was and also how unpopular of a war it was. So I thought I would do an episode just as a sort of intro period on these wars. So let's begin with Mary, Queen of Scots, who was born this past week on the 8th of December, 1542. She was, famously, only six days old when her father died after the Battle of Solway Moss. This battle can help inform us of the situation between England and Scotland leading up to this period. 
So England and Scotland had been at each other's throats for centuries. The borderlands were dangerous. Even the border itself was fluid, with sides continuously changing. The border was populated by people who developed this habit of raiding between the countries. The raids were often exploited by others. The border was divided into six regions called the Marches. There was the East, Middle, and West, both English and Scottish sides. And each march was governed by a warden appointed by his king to keep the peace. It's also important to remember that there are various sets of alliances and relationships going on here. Scotland had a great relationship with France. This is called the Auld Alliance, A-U-L-D. England's relationship with France and the rest of Europe was pretty sketchy at this point. England had, of course, left the Catholic Church, and the Pope had essentially approved any kind of attack against England. And then there was England and Scotland, which had had this up and down relationship for centuries. So now we need to detour for a second, because the next few years where England makes peace with Spain and makes war on France is known in history books as the Italian War of 1542-46. And it comes about in part because France began to have a good relationship with the Ottoman Empire, which was, of course, pretty much an anathema to the rest of Catholic Europe. There were also strained relations with Spain already, and it bubbled up in 1542. Henry wanted to get involved with it and invade France because Henry lived his life seeming to just look for opportunities to invade France and relive the glory or rebuild England's glory and and, and go back to the Hundred Years' War and just be this warrior king. But if England was going to invade France, it needed to shut the back door. Essentially, it needed to mess with the old alliance between Scotland and France. England couldn't be having French troops invade from the north through Scotland or even have Scottish troops making mischief there while he was busy invading France. So that needed to be handled. So let's start with that Battle of Solway Moss, where James V was killed soon after. When Henry VIII broke from the church and founded the Church of England, he wanted his nephew, James V, to do the same and to follow in his footsteps. But James refused. Not only that, but James had the audacity to snub Henry. Remember that famous Northern Progress that we hear about because it's when Catherine Howard supposedly got up to all her shenanigans with Thomas Culpepper? Well, it was on that progress that Henry VIII was supposed to meet with his nephew, James. But James stood Henry up. They were supposed to meet in York and James never showed up. Henry got super mad, sent raiding parties into Scotland to show his frustration. James responded by raising an army. And on the 24th of November, 1542, an army of between 15,000 and 18,000 Scots advanced into England. And they were surprised by English people waiting for them. An English army was waiting for them. Now, they outnumbered the English, but the English won. The Scots were defeated mightily. Many were taken prisoner, where they were moved back to London to spend the Christmas holidays with Henry at court. They were mostly well-treated, and Henry was hopeful that they would influence Scottish sympathies towards him. And this was even more important because suddenly there was the potential for a marriage alliance because Scotland had a new queen. James had had a baby girl. The infant Mary could easily marry Henry's son, Edward. What Henry was after here was a way to unite the thrones of England and Scotland, under England, of course. This would have been Henry's way to fight against the Auld Alliance with France and to secure the northern border. Now, in Scotland, there was a pro-English party and a pro-French party, and the two began to fight against each other for years until the pro-French party finally won. Henry saw that there was this uncertainty because there was a period of a regency where all of the different nobles were going to fight against themselves to see who would get to be regent, and he proposed this marriage between Mary and Edward, hoping for a union of Scotland and England. On the 1st of July, 1543, the Treaty of Greenwich was signed, promising that at the age of 10, Mary would marry Edward and move to England, where Henry could oversee her upbringing. The treaty also said that the two countries would remain legally separate, and if Mary and Edward should fail to have children, the temporary union would dissolve. But then the Scottish Cardinal Beaton, who also had a claim to the Regency himself, rose to power and began to push a pro-Catholic, pro-French agenda, gaining power and making the whole thing even more uncertain. Mary was scheduled to be crowned, and shortly before her coronation, 
Henry arrested Scottish merchants who were headed for France and impounded their goods. This, of course, caused a lot of anger in Scotland. And the Treaty of Greenwich was rejected by the Parliament of Scotland that December. The rejection of the marriage treaty and the renewal of the alliance between France and Scotland prompted Henry's rough wooing. This was a military campaign designed to impose the marriage of Mary to his son. He said, if you won't do it nicely, I'll just force you to marry my son. And it was essentially raids going back and forth for several years. But one of the worst parts of it was the complete burning of Edinburgh. That burning happened in May of 1544, when the English Earl of Hartford, Duke of Somerset, brother of Jane Seymour, raided Edinburgh, burning it completely. And they had to move Mary for her safety. Contemporary sources say that every building in the capital, including Holyrood Abbey and the palace, was burnt. Only the castle managed to hold firm. English ships were filled with looted goods at Leith and they sailed south. The English army itself retreated back over land, generally being completely terrible and burning things as they went. Meanwhile, Henry instructed all of the pro-English agents to spread the rumor that the invasion was completely the fault of Cardinal Beaton. They wanted to ferment this anti-Catholic feeling and bolster the Protestant faction, which was beginning to grow at this point as well, and later people like John Knox would really solidify it. A year later, the Scots gained a little bit of revenge at the Battle of Ancrum Moor, and this was essentially where the two forces fought against each other. The English had been marauding around in the borders and generally causing mischief, and the Scots were like, no, you're going to stop, and they beat them. Then in May of 1546, Cardinal Beaton was murdered by a group of Protestants. And then things sort of subsided a bit after Henry died. But France also had a new king in Henry II, who was out for revenge and was much more of a warmongering kind of king than his predecessor, Francis. Henry II of France wanted to unite France and Scotland by marrying the queen, Mary, to his three-year-old son, the Dauphin, Francis. The English, meanwhile, were still leaving trails of devastation around behind them, they seized the strategic town of Haddington around February of 1548, and Mary had to be moved to Dumbarton Castle. In June of the same year, French help arrived at Leith to besiege and ultimately take Haddington back. And then on the 7th of July, 1548, the Scottish Parliament, held at a nunnery near the town, agreed to the French marriage. Twenty years later, the diplomat Ralph Sadler, who you may know from Wolf Hall, had worked with Cromwell. He talked about the feeling, the Scottish opinion of the marriage to England. There was a man called Adam Otterburn who had spoken to Ralph Sadler, and he said, I'm not even going to try to do it in a Scottish accent. <laughs> I thought about it there for a minute, but I'm just not even going to try. So he said, our people do not like of it. And though the governor and some of the nobility have consented to it, yet I know that few or none of them do like it, and our common people do utterly mislike of it. I pray you give me leave to ask you a question. If your lad was a lass and our lass were a lad, would you then be so earnest in this matter? And likewise, I assure you that our nation will never agree to have an Englishman king of Scotland. And though the whole nobility of the realm would consent, yet our common people and the stones in the street would rise and rebel against it. So the Scots were not in favor of this, of this marriage at all. They were much more in favor of France. So Protector Somerset, the new King Edward's uncle, put a lot of money into defense in both Scotland and France in Calais. He fortified castles and added troops. And this was expensive and deeply unpopular in most of England, which was dealing with a number of economic crises around the time. This is also when we start to see a lot of the rebellions um, around land enclosures, too. So an English invasion then in September of 1547, about nine months after Henry VIII's death, did win a major battle, the Battle of Pinky, where even though they were outnumbered, the English managed to beat the Scots leave 10,000 of them dead on the battlefield. They also put much of southern Scotland under military occupation. During that 
time, Somerset actually got as far as Leith, but then he abandoned a full victory. The country was already nearly bankrupt, and spending more time and money on the war would have been devastating. By 1548, like I said, Mary was taken away to safety and she was betrothed to the Dauphin. And then the English started spending money on Spanish, German, and Italian mercenaries to augment their own army. But Scotland was given more money and help from France and was able to add to their army and fight back any raids and incursions, and things were really at a standstill. The English abandoned Haddington on the 19th of September, 1549, and the hostilities with Scotland ended in the Treaty of Bologna in March of 1550, which was between France and England. On Saturday, the 29th of March, 1550, peace was declared in England. And just a week earlier, the Privy Council had sent secret orders to English commanders telling them not to move cannon. These cannon were going to be abandoned to the Scots. Then there were conditions to return prisoners and dismantle border fortifications. And as part of the treaty, six French and English hostages, very high up people, famous people, were going to be exchanged on the 7th of April. Then the next year, there was a separate peace negotiation between Scotland and the Holy Roman Empire. This was necessary to resolve trade and piracy disputes. This was concluded in May of 1551 in the Treaty of Norham. And that formally ended the war and any English military presence withdrew from Scotland. And then by October of 1551, Marie of Guise herself was welcomed into England, and she traveled from Portsmouth to meet Edward VI in London. And this was, you know, nine years after this thing started in 1542. And of course, then 52 years later, in 1603, Marie of Guise's grandson, James VI, became James I of England, finally uniting the two countries, though not in the way that Henry VIII had hoped or expected. So that's it for the rough wooing. You can get show notes with sources at englandcast.com slash wooing. That's W-O-O-I-N-G. Let me know what you thought about the episode. You can get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016-TESCO. That's 801-683-9756. Or you can join the new Tudor Learning Circle, which is a free social network just for Tudor history nerds. It's like Facebook, but without Facebook. (laughs) It's like just Tudor Facebook. So check that out. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you are having a joyful Advent season. And I will talk with you again soon. (laughs) Thanks so much.